from the land of the zombies. Um, I appreciate all of your prayers for me to get better. Um, I don't know, ever since COVID, I don't know when I, I get bronchitis, it gets worse and worse. Um, so this is a rough one. Um, but we're, we're glad. We learn a lot when we're not doing well. When we're sick, we learn a lot. And God does meet us there. Uh, just a couple of, one announcement, I just want to remind all the men, we're, we're meeting on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, we're going to go through the book of James. I sent out a note. Uh, this is another reminder. I would love to have you at 7 o'clock. I, I uh, would hope that uh, many of you, if possible, we could get together and go over this wonderful book of the Bible uh, to help us grow in Christ. Um, let's, uh, we're, we're going to go back into 1 Peter, and it's a unique topic for us today, uh, the topic of the Christian home. Um, why don't we, uh, let's, let's begin there. Let, let's read, let's begin with um, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Would would you all stand together for the reading of God's word? Peter tells the church in uh, northern uh, Turkey, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the context, by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respect and pure conduct, do not let your adorning of be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold, jewelry, or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, verse 7, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as she is the weaker vessel. Uh, since they are heirs, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. We pray together. Father, we ask you to bring this word home. Uh, not all of us are directly have application to this uh, due to being single uh, or, or widowed or widower. Uh, we just pray that these, these principles would come to us all, that you would encourage us in this area of the Christian home, um, and that you would strengthen us and teach us. Uh, help us, Lord, as we see here, to be more like Jesus, uh, because it's in his name we pray. Amen. Why it's uh, really interesting, I believe, uh, very important to preach through Bible books. One of the reasons we preach through the books of the Bible is because, you know, women submitting to your husbands is not a topic that I would just say, oh, I think we need to preach on that. That's just not something that's going to come across my screen uh, very often, uh, something I think we need to do. And so as we go through the books of the Bible, we are confronted with topics and subjects uh, that help us and some things that uh, we need to know uh, that we may have forgotten about. Uh, and so, uh, submission in the home. Uh, Peter, Peter tells us uh, that the wives are... Sub we, we, uh, we've already talked about it. Chapter 2, it's all Christians are to be in subjection, in submission to the human government. We looked at slaves in the middle of chapter 2, ought to be subject to their masters. All employees should be subject to their employers. And all these details were given. Then they're reminded that Jesus, uh, at the end of chapter 2, he uh, uh, was in submission to Roman and Jewish authorities. He did not give in. He did not cave in. Um, but he suffered under their hands in his righteous life. He would not shut up. He would not do what they ask him to do, as that would have break God's law. He would not break God's law, and he would continue to preach the gospel 
And so, but he suffered silently, quietly. We, are, we learn there uh, that you can live a righteous life with suffer, if suffering comes. And this is in our world right now. We should be prepared for this as we say no. Um, it's funny. The government, Peter says to the, in verse 13, chapter 2, he said, I want all you, all of us, all Christians, to be in subjection to the authorities. For the authorities were given by God to punish evil and to encourage good. That's why human authorities were given. And he says, I know you're your own nation. Back in chapter 2, verse 8, you are a holy nation, a holy, a holy, a holy, I used to say holy, a holy priesthood. You, you are a nation, you are my people, I am your king, and you are a nation on this earth. While you're here on this earth, I want you to submit to the human authority. It's a wild thought. How do, we, we're not Israel anymore. We're Gentiles, all scattered all over the world. How should we live in our nation? How should we live in our state, in our country? Peter gives it, makes it clear. Jesus made it clear. Paul made it clear. Subject yourself. Be a good citizen under these countries. But if they ever switch roles, and this is, I got a little pushback from the last time we talked about this, but if they ever switch roles, if they ever decide not to punish evil, but to encourage evil, and punish righteousness, then you cannot submit to them. You must obey God. You look through these rulers to God. You, you submit yourself to God. And in by faith, you submit yourself to them. But if they are encouraging you, we're, I just read a book about Bonhoeffer, um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who, who was a pastor in the Lutheran church in 1930s. 1933, Hitler came to power. 1939, the World War II began by his invasion of Poland. During that time, 33 to 39, let's say 33 to 38, that country of Germany had a lot of decisions to make, very hard decisions. How to, do we submit to this? And so many of them did. Uh, and the churches submitted to the German authorities to the point of what they could say, what they could not preach. Dietrich Bonhoeffer started a movement of rebellion, saying we are not going to give in to this. Um, and uh, he got, well, he got hung for it eventually. He, like Jesus, gave his life to doing right and doing righteousness. Um, so if they try to reverse it, primarily obey your government. But if your government gets upside down and backwards, uh, then you cannot. If they won't let you preach, if they won't let you read your Bible, if they won't let you go to church, if they won't let you evangelize, you, you cannot obey and submit to them. You should not. Uh, so, um, the, the, Peter's going to talk to about a, an unbelieving husband. What does a wife do about that? What if you, what, how, how do Christians respond to an unbelieving government? And in the middle there, how do uh, employers, employees submit to unbelieving employers? We've already preached sermons on those. I would just spend time, hopefully, in review. Now Peter goes uh, from the government to the workplace to the home, submission in the home. Um, and and I, I'd like to, to talk about this. This, this, this topic has always been a difficult topic. Um, I, I, but I, I just, I just want to remind, uh, just, just remind us that marriage, we, we can even call it traditional marriage, but I'd rather call it biblical marriage between a husband and a wife forever, uh, monogamous, exclusive, a relationship that lasts as long as the partners live um, is a beautiful, wonderful, it's, it's God's idea. He created men, he created women, and he gave them roles to live in this relationship. He knows what, they're, what women are like, character. They're, they have uniquenesses that men do not have. Men have uniquenesses that women do not have. Uh, there's generalities, we can say. There's always exceptions to the rules. But this is how God established it. Husbands lead and the wife follows. And, and I always got to say here that in general, something we always got to remember because this was way out of line a decade, uh, no, centuries ago. Women are not to submit to men in general. Isn't it not that, that men aren't over women in general? They're not. They're not the leaders of women in general. It's in the home. That's it. 
And there's some, there's some responsibilities in the church. But God had never, never intended. There's equality between men and women. Okay, I just say that. But, but I, I want to remind us about the Christian home, uh, the biblical home or the traditional home, uh, that this is God's idea. It's not a suggestion. It's a mandate, it's a mandate for God's people. And to just remind you that it's, it's assailed today. It's attacked it's ridiculed, it's mocked, it's thought of as abusive and hurtful and harmful. I can't tell you what I've heard and what I've read. We, maybe we've all seen marriage in general, especially a biblical Christian marriage where a wife and a husband have two separate roles just be slammed over and over again as ridiculous. Why don't we just make up our own rules Every couple should do whatever they want to do, from men with men and women with women. And, and polymory is the big one now where the home is going to be filled with three people, four people. There's going to be a relationship. All these things all move this direction when God is left out of society. God is eliminated from the society. Then we decide to do anything we want. And, and I just, just want to remind us, this is God's plan. Uh, this is God's way, and it is the best way. It is the most beautiful way. Um, uh, I'll even use the word satisfying. It's funny because research has shown this over and over again. Let me read this. This article came across my desk. <coughs> Researchers have well established that marriage is associated with numerous positive outcomes for both adults and children. Marriage is the factor most strongly associated with human happiness. Marriage is the closest factor associated with human happiness. And it is also linked with greater financial well-being and better health. <laughs> That's funny. Um, if I was single, I'd, I'd probably be almost dead by now. <laughs> Marriage provides the best environment for children to grow and develop into thriving adults. Children raised by their married parents are much less likely to be poor, have a far lower risk of being abused, are more likely to graduate from high school, attend college, and to experience social mobility. The share, uh, the share of married parents in community is one of the greatest factors predicting uh, social mobility for children. Marriage is also significantly more stable than cohabitating relationships. Children born to married parents are much less likely to experience parental breakup compared to children whose parents are living together. This, despite the numerous proven benefits of marriage, it makes sense that quite a few Americans are agnostic regarding its value. They just don't care, don't know. Marriage rates in the U.S. have declined uh, exponentially during the last several decades. Unwed childbearing, unwed childbearing is the norm in many communities, and nearly half of all the children in the U.S. spend at least part of their childhood in a non-intact family. Thus, fewer Americans have been raised in homes and communities where they see uh, examples of strong marriages. Uh, so here we are. Um, a lot of you are, well, I'm not married. I've never been married, or I'm divorced, or I'm widowed. Um, and so we, we just want to help us all find that this is God's way. Um, it, you still can flourish in your life and not be married as a Christian. Uh, you can be all that God wants you to be if he has not brought a wife or a husband or taken your wife or your husband. Um, but this is, is what God is saying. Men and women are to come together and be committed. You know, marriage is it's fascinating because uh, two people who are from different families become family. Generally, how do you become family? Well, you have, you have babies. Babies are the family. Your family is your children and your, your brothers and your sisters. And but, but the mom and the dad are two separate families, and they are brought together how? They are brought together in covenant. They are brought together under God's promises and pledges that people make. Marriage is the most unique thing because two people who aren't family become family just like being born into the family. That's how solid and strong the covenant should be. Like being, I remember I, this came very alive to me because I had I was born in a, a a great home with with mom and dad who loved each other, not Christians, but uh, basically uh, 
did, did the traditional marriage, but they loved each other deeply. And I remember it was in high school. I, I was in high school that I realized my parents were not siblings. Now, that's the weirdest thing you ever heard in your life. I'm sorry, okay? Because I, they were so close, and I didn't get this. I, oh, I had, my mom had her family, my dad. I mean, I was living in this, okay? It's not like they did something weird. I, I was just, I was just, they were so close and so one that it was hard for me to grasp, but I, it wasn't until I met other kids who had parents who weren't close, who were divorced, that I realized that could have, that, that could happen to me, but it just seemed impossible because my mom and dad were so close um, and, and so one in their relationship. Now, I, I really believe that one of the reasons why marriage is under attack and under assault now is because so many people have had terrible experience. My experience, not what their experience has been. Their experience has been misery because of a dad who doesn't fulfill his role who is either full of fear, doesn't do what he's supposed to, or he's abusive, over-the-top, pushy, um, and, and the same with the Lord. We have drug problems, alcohol problems, uh, promiscuity problems, all adultery problems, and this comes into a marriage, gives children like, not doing that. Not gonna get, I'm not going to get tied up with that again. Um, and so we throw out the pattern because of the abuse. This happens. People throw out God because he doesn't do what they want him to do. You know, he, he allows some suffering or some pain into their life. Terrible pain, terrible suffering. They throw him out. They throw the church out because a pastor uh, abused or an elder abused or terrible things. So here we are. God sets the pattern. Sinful people come into this. They fail, and other people reject the pattern. And we want to say is, please, let's not reject the pattern. The pattern works. The pattern is right. And if we go through this, We'll, we'll see more uh, about that. So here's the spiritual leaders. Here's where you go. Here's what dads are supposed to do. Here's what husbands are the spiritual leaders in the family. Um, this is the way God has designed it. Um, the buck stops with the husband. The Lord holds the husbands accountable. The, the, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really narrow this down more than most people would. I'm going to narrow this down a little bit into spiritual leadership. We're going to talk about this is this is a husband is where the buck stops for spiritual leadership in the home. Uh, I, I, and that that trickles down into all kinds of areas in the home. Right. So that this is his job. Verse 26 of Ephesians five. He might sanctify his wife, help his wife grow in Christ. That's what sanctification is. Having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. He brings the word into the home. He brings sanctification into the home. Um, this is, <coughs> oh, don't do that. <coughs> this is um, the responsibility of the husband. Uh, the, how does the ch family attend church? Does the family attend church? Does the family read the Bible together? What about the entertainment that comes into our home? What about friends and associates that come into our home? What about our giving? Do we live less uh, with less money in order to give more money away? What about family ministry? What does the family do? How do we involved in, in the ministry for Jesus? Um, this all is what the, holds the husband accountable. This is the leadership of a man in the home, spiritual leadership. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, we could we talk about this. Jesus talks about leadership all the time, and and, and leadership has got to be done humbly and lovingly. Uh, we'll talk more about it in a minute when we get to the wife, the husband's responsibilities in verse 7. Uh, but the husband is the main, is the leader of the home. Now, a lot of times you get married, this isn't much of an issue with Susan and I. Why? Because we were on the same page when we got married. Basically, we were on the same page. This is what we want for our home. This is what we want for our kids. This is what we want in our finances. This is how we want to serve the Lord. I'm going to the ministry. What about it? Okay, I'll go. So we go together. So a lot of times when you're on the same page, this whole spiritual leadership and submission, it really isn't even an issue in your home. It's not much of an issue at all because it's just something that happens because you're two. And, and, and another thing. <laughs> uh, um, what's... The first thing I ask a, a young couple who want to be married in, in premarital counseling, I said, so what's the purpose of a Christian marriage? What is the purpose? What, what's happening here? Why, 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 what do you think God's purpose is for you? 
And the purpose is very simple, stated in uh, Genesis 2, that the two who were far away from each other would become closer and actually in marriage become one flesh, become one person. This is what God's goal. This is how you bring glory to God in your home, by being one. So if the roles of spiritual leadership are causing division rather than unity, then you're not doing your roles properly, generally. Um, somebody's got a bad attitude. Uh, so this idea of the two roles, God created, we see here that God created men and women totally equal, different, different but equal, uh, same spiritual authority, same spiritual life, um, and he gives them different roles. I want the husband to lead. I want the woman to be the helper and follower. This is how I want it to be done in the house. Doesn't, that doesn't go for the whole world. doesn't go out in the, out in the streets. Uh, this is not for your brother. This is not for some relative. This is, this is just for your husband, your own husband. Uh, that's, how I, that's how I want it to work. I'm going to give two different roles for two important equal people. Okay? Now, I, I say that it's very spiritual, and I keep it narrow because of 1 Timothy 5.14. This is somebody, this is a verse you don't hear much of. This freaked me out when I first heard this because I didn't know how in the world we were going to apply this verse. I would have younger widows. Here's Paul giving household rules um, in 1 Timothy who was asking him questions about the home. And a woman would have, uh, she'd be in her 20s or maybe 30s and her husband would die. What does she do? Stay married, get, uh, stay unmarried or get married? What should she do? Oh, I want her to get married. Um, she should uh, bear children, get married, bear children, and, and manage her household or their household and give the adversary no occasion for slander. No sense in her being signal, single and having temptation. If she wants to marry, God brings somebody in her life, they should get married. But he says manage, manage. That is a, that is, I'm going to, we're going to go, we're going to do a little Greek. I hate to do it because, but this, this is, this is strong. Um, the, the word for manage here in the, I think it's NIV or ESV, I'm not sure. Uh, they all do it a little different, but they all do it weak. Uh, they're afraid to do it too strong because it, it, it would, how does that fit in with what Peter just said about her, the wife to be in submission to the husband? This, this oiko, okay, oiko is a Greek word. That's the English writing of it. It means house, just a house. Simple words used thousands of times. One of the first words you learn in Greek is oiko. It just means home or house. The second word is despot. Now, we might know what a despot is. We might have learned that word. Uh, it's not used very often anymore, but that is an old-fashioned English word for a dictator, a rotten, mean dictator, a despot. Now, that's in English. That rolled over into English, and despot came out. It's not what it means in the Greek. That's not what Jesus, Jesus uses this phrase, oiko despot. He used it numerous times, referring to the master of the house, referring to the landowner. He used it in parables. This is the only time it's used in the epistles. But what Peter is saying is, and I'll say it, he's kind of the boss. Okay? I, I'm sorry, husbands, to just do this to you, but you knew it's true anyway, right? We all know who's running the place. We, we, we might laugh, at, we might not think it's true. We may go, oh, this is pretty radical. But this is what's really happening in our homes, right? She is the uh, oiko in the Greek. It's despoteo. It's a, it's a verb. She's the household boss. This is her domain that she runs how? With humility and love under the authority of her husband. Paul said, and this is Paul saying this. And we all read Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, be in submission to your own husbands. And then later on, uh, towards the end of his life, he writes this, that she should become uh, the master of her house. So we're going to say that. We're going to say she is under the authority of her husband. This is why I'm saying the buck stops with the husband in spiritual things. And because they're working towards unity, then they would work towards unity in all other things. All other things, we've got to come to agreement. How can we come to an agreement? How much money we spend here? Where are we going on vacation? All this stuff. The husband is not some dictator. The wife is involved because we're always moving towards 
Unity. Man, the greatest ingredient to unity is humility. We're going to talk about that. So wives can conduct, why a wife's conduct can convince an unbelieving husband. So that this is Peter is very concerned about this. Women would become Christians uh, after they were married. This happened a lot in the first century. It happens a lot today. The, the, they would be married, and then some gospel preacher would come in, or some friend would witness to them, and they would become Christians. Peter is saying um, that um, here's here's how the wife uh, should deal with an unbelieving husband. She, she shouldn't divorce him. She shouldn't run away. Uh, she shouldn't lock herself in her room. This is what she should try to do, right? So he says in verse 2, respect your husband, um, right? In verse 2, when, you, when they see you're respectful, uh, timos, the honoring, the honoring, you will honor the husband. This is cool. Oh, man, this is going to take all the faith you have to honor an unbelieving husband. Just like it'll take all the faith you have to honor an unbelieving government. It'll take a lot of faith to honor an unbelieving employer who's driving you crazy, who doesn't make sense, whose rules aren't correct. Honor, honor, honor. Honor, man, to human beings is hard generally. When they're not on the same page as you, that is hard, crazy hard. How do we do it? By faith. By faith. We look through that person. Remember I had Tom up here just before Tom got sick? I brought Tom up here and I said, how do you, how does, if he's an unbeliever and you're married to him or he's the boss, how do you honor, how do you, how do you look at him and submit yourself to Tom? Why? You, you submit to him because you see right through him. You see over the top of him is Jesus. And Jesus has put that person in your life and you submit to Jesus as you submit to your husband. So we have this respect that takes great faith for the Christian woman and to live an unhypocritical lifestyle. He says your pure conduct. That can be moral purity, obviously. You're going to be morally pure. You're not going to win your husband by running around, obviously. That's crazy. But so we can take pure and we can say a a pureness of unhypocritical. What will destroy your unbelieving husband's confidence in you faster than anything, seeing you be a hypocrite. We, right, in the home, hypocrisy is the killer of the home. It's a home, man, and you're, when you're a hypocrite in front of your kids, when you're big smiles in church, turning the page, got your hand up, all about prayer and everything, then you're cursing out the, the football team on, at home, whatever, you know? What, what's all this about? Your life isn't matching your your, your, your private life doesn't match your public life. And who sees this more than anybody? Your wife or your, or your husband and your kids. They see this clear, crystal clear. Uh, and hypocrisy destroys evangelism in the home uh, more than anything. So he says to, to, he says to the wife, respect, honor your husband. Man, it'll take faith in God. That'll take all your faith in God. You'll blow it regularly so you apologize. You, you, you work hard at honoring your husband, and you live an unhypocritical lifestyle. Uh, don't fall into worldliness. And he goes on about this, all this makeup and gold jewelry and all this. Oh, man, I can't believe the debate and all the talk this has caused over the years about how uh, makeup and clothing. Oh, hey, the Bible's pretty clear with women's dress modesty. Be modest as much as you can, okay? We're, I am so grateful that he didn't give us a bunch of rules, you know, Three inches below the knee and no high heels and only this much rouge or whatever, right? Aren't you glad that we don't have all these silly rules? And some sects of Christianity have brought these rules into their group and it's just everybody's the same and ah, da 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 Don't fall into, let's just call it this. Don't try worldliness to win your husband. Now I'm going to add another thing. I got a lot to say. I, I, I've been around Christian marriages all my, all my adult life. I'm married. I got that. And then I've done a lot of help. I've tried to help couples for years and years and years. And you know what? Um, a, a wife, uh, it's, not, it's not just an unbelieving husband she needs to win. Sometimes it's a weak husband. In fact, that's my problem that I have seen much more than an abusive, over-the-top husband. I have seen the weak husband. 
who don't lead, who just shrug their shoulders, don't have any investment in eternality, in eternal things, um, and let the wife just do whatever she wants or however they want and goes along with everything. And th this, all this stuff, that goes for that situation too. Don't respect your husband even though you don't feel respect for him. You know, a lot of, most of the time, lots of times, the women are smarter than the husbands. They're certainly more emotionally sensitive than the husbands. They got all these things going for them. And it'd be easy to put your husband down, to not respect him. We'll see at the end of this sermon, that is a bad idea. Respect your husbands, love your wives. That's what it boils down to the Christian marriage. Respect your husbands, love your wives. You respect your husbands as you respect Jesus. Okay, so don't fall into worldliness to change your unbelieving or your uh, uh, a weak husband and cultivate gospel humility. Let your inner self speak. He says, cultivate a gentle, quiet spirit. A gentle, quiet spirit. Um, uh, the hidden, verse four, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with an imperishable beauty, a gentle, quiet spirit. And this is very precious in God's eyes. I grew up with this verse. Uh, thinking about when I was going to get married, and and you know I I married one of these gentle quiet spirits, you know so that's been good, um, but but I'm telling you this isn't this isn't some special little thing for Christian wives, this is not, I, as as I studied this a long time ago, but then more just recently, this is Christianity 101. It's what I said. Uh, excuse me. What the verse we read this morning alive about Jesus said. Pick up your cross and follow me daily, right? Deny yourself. Don't pursue your own life. Give up your life, and you will find your life. This is a, I, I'm sorry, uh, ladies. This is what God is asking you to do in your marriage. He's asking you um, to be a gentle, gentle. Gentle is Jesus. I mean, it's, it's such a big word, prouse. P-R-A-U-S, it's used, used so much. It's the same word we use for meek. Jesus was meek. Um, Jesus said the meek will inherit the earth. The same word here that Peter uses for the wife. The, the humble, gentle person who isn't nagging, fighting, pressing, gnashing of teeth, and, and <coughs> complaining and grumbling. That's what he's saying, don't. Do. And this is hard not to do. This is hard not to do. So he's saying, he's saying this is gospel humility. This isn't some little special woman's humility. This is where we're all headed. This is where all Christians are headed. Gospel humility. Laying myself down, giving myself to the to the good of others, my wife, uh, and or here, my husband. Let your inner self Speak quietness. I, 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 I love this idea. Um, and, and Paul told the Thessalonians, he said in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, he said, um, uh, aspire to live quietly. He said, aspire, he's talking to all Christians, aspire, work hard at living quietly in your life. That's just crazy. Because Jesus did the same thing. He was quiet. He preached the word. Uh, he spoke when, when he needed to speak. Uh, but basically, when he was pressed, when he was attacked, he was quiet. He was like a lamb before his shears is quiet. Um, and so this is Christianity 101. This isn't some special woman dispensation in the home. This is what you're working on all the time. Gentleness and quietness. Uh, with, um, with all humility, Paul said, and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Uh, the word gentle is so huge for all Christians um, rather than pressing. Oh, I got it there. Um, with all humility and gentleness, okay? So I got to move. Christians, hu Christian husbands grow in intimacy with their wives. Now he's talked to the wives about, he spent some extra time because he's talking about an unbelieving husband and how you will win them. Uh, and, not, and not with worldly ways, uh, but with just seeking to be a, 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 a committed follower of Jesus Christ and dying to my life and living for Jesus. 
Likewise, hus husbands live in humble and humility, in gospel humility. Look what he says in verse 7, likewise, husbands. Likewise, husbands? You mean, he say, is he saying husbands, submit to your wife? He just said, wives, submit to your husbands. Now he's saying, likewise, husbands, submit to your wife? No, that would be, that would be you know, ridiculous. But what he's saying is, as I'm asking the, the wife to act in gospel humility, I'm asking her to die to herself and to put you ahead of herself. That is extremely hard to do. I'm asking you to do the same thing. I am asking you to live in gospel humility, and here's the proof in the pudding, what Paul tells uh, husbands. My goodness sakes, this would make your, all of our hair curly. Uh, this is difficult. This is the most difficult thing. Love your wives. He just doesn't say love them, you know, or like you love Buicks. Uh, or, 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 or like you love whatever. He's saying love them like Christ loves you. Like, whoa. Uh, this is the spiritual leadership. This is where it's born. This is where it lives in love like Christ. That's how, that's spiritual leadership. Um, I'll tell you, in this, in this aquarium, right, I, I find that in all the times I've helped couples, this is where a wife rocks when she's loved. When she knows she's in, and I say aquarium, like she's, she's, she's in the water of love. You know, she's, it's, it's, it's all around her. She knows she's loved. She knows she's protected. She knows she's cared for. She knows that her husband, although she's supposed to submit to him, he has put her first in his life. It goes even farther. Peter goes farther. He says, husband, seek to know your wife. Seek to know her, showing, um, live in an understanding way. An understanding way. This is love your wife literally according to knowledge. Grow in intimacy in understanding your wife. This is the men's side of things. This takes a lot of faith because we're terrible at this. I don't like to talk. And I find myself not really good at listening. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I'd just rather come home and sit with a cup of coffee and not talk about my day, right? And I, I'm really interested in what Susan's saying about her day, but most of it's just going flying over the top of my head uh, like I'm uh, in a plane and she's talking and I can't hear anything. That's bad. As the wife has to live by faith and submit to her husband and honor him, you have, to, you have to die to yourself and start to figure out how to grow closer and more intimate with your wife. Because it, it goes against the grain of most, this is generalities, most men, not all men, but most men uh, aren't good at communication of their emotions and uh, don't know their wife. You, know, you, you, you have to know your wife and honor her. He'll say here, as the weaker vessel, this throws everybody for a loop, um, the weaker vessel gets a, a lot of people excited and angry, um, but we all know that's true, correct? I mean, the transgender movement's trying to change all that, uh, but we know that a wife is uh, a woman, a female, is less strong than a man, um, and that's all Peter's talking about. Uh, the next phrase, he'll say, honor her, because she's has the... She is part of, of the inheritance of life. Um, God sees her exact with you. You guys are both going to heaven together. She's at work. He's at work in your life, just like he, she, he's at work in your life. They're, 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 you're the same, but you differ this way. Take care of her. Honor her. Protect her. Provide for her. You're different. Uh, she is, a, her vessel is weak. That's why he uses the word vessel. Um, and so get to know her in an understanding way. She is physically weeder, weaker than you are. Uh, Peter just states the obvious. But she is equal with you in God's sight. And she is equal with you in God's honor. Honor her according to. Um, and, then, and then Peter closes. Uh, Sins against your wife will break your relationship with God. At the end of verse 7, it's just crazy, right? Um, the grace of life. She's, she is heir with you, the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. 
don't break relationship with your wife or you are just you're breaking relationship with your God with God uh, I, I don't know of a more serious one of the most serious warnings in the New Testament uh, live with her according to knowledge grow in intimacy die to yourself and start to put her first and figure out how to listen and talk and communicate and learn more about her, honor her as an heir of life. And if you don't, your prayers will not be answered. Wow. Just telling us what, what the psalmist said. I cherish iniquity in my heart. The Lord would not have listened. Um, our prayer life uh, is critical to how we live. And then lastly, I, I just want to remind you again what we started with. A biblical traditional marriage is, a beaut is beautiful and it's satisfying. I know it can be ugly and a mess. All, mar all relationships can be broken by sin. And I'm so sorry for you if your relationship has been broken by sin that you've been in or you're or witnessed to from your parents. I am so sorry for you. But let's not be ashamed of God's design. If a husband or a, or a wife in gospel humility will love one another and follow their roles as best they can, there is nothing more beautiful on earth. It's like two couple, a couple coming and doing ballroom dancing. I can't do ballroom dancing. It'd be like a bowling ball. But a, ball, a ballroom dancing um, and two people who come together and they both decide one's going to lead and one's going to follow. And once they decide for the leader to lead and the, the follower to follow, and then they start to move on the dance floor. And they move, they move as one. They move as beautiful one on the dance floor. The two become one as they, in humility, uh, uh, follow the roles. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one as they live the dance together, right? Um, embrace your marital role in Christ-like humility. That's the end of it. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself. Love your wife. That's the other admonition. I didn't even talk about it. Love, him as Christ. love her as Christ loves her, but also love her like you love yourself. He's got both love commands in the one command in this section. The one command is, the whole text is love her as you are loved. That's, that's John 13, you know. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. And then he said before that in Matthew that we should, we should love our neighbor as ourself. And here we see it here in Ephesians 5, that whole text, not just this verse. Love her as, you would, as, as Christ loves you. Love her as your neighbor as you would love yourself. And let the wife see that she honors her husband, honor her husband by faith, love, by faith, right? Uh, so a great text to remind us of the beauty of Christian marriage, to help us, encourage us in it. If, you fall, if you're hearing this and you're falling short, praise the Lord. It's so simple to make the decisions, to confess your sins, to make a recommitment to this. Uh, if this is something that's way out of your sweet spot because you're not married or whatever, this is something you can stand for, agree with, help young couples, encourage people to follow this direction and not throw this out because it doesn't work in today's world. It does. It will always work. Um, can we pray together now? Uh, Lord, we thank you for what we've learned here um, in this text. Uh, uh, we thank you for the beauty of Christian marriage and a wonder of your love. This whole thing is a picture of your relationship with us. Um, the dance that we dance with you as we come closer to you and grow closer to you, submit our lives to you um, and become more like you. We walk in unity with our relationship, our relationships, our home relationship and our friend relationship. Uh, we just pray you would meet us uh, this week in application, we pray that you would guard our hearts um, and that you, we would not walk away without looking in the mirror today. In Jesus' name we pray.